This was as our hotel was being built. We opened up in 1986. So this was probably maybe a couple years before. You can see the pillars that hold up our roof. You can see the glass roof. It was pretty similar, isn't it? So now I'll just mention now the Prickster family, this is the majority shareholders of High Corporation. They give a prize every year called the Prickster Prize to one of the living architects that they decide is prestigious enough and they go back probably about some 50 odd years and some of the greatest architects that are alive today have been Prickster Prize winners. There is no Nobel Prize for architecture. So the Prickster Prize is considered that Nobel Prize. And this is a photo I took from probably our fourth floor balcony, again, showing you the architecture here. Uh, when I first started working, I was like, you know, this is like working in an Egyptian temple. If you've ever seen uh, some of the architecture uh, with the high ceilings like that in the various uh, monuments that are in, in Egypt and uh, where they went to worship uh, their gods, this is very similar. And this is a shot from a lower view. This is our called Winfield's Cafe. Uh, I'm not sure the Winfield is named after, but Frank uh, F.W. Woolworths, who built uh, the largest skyscraper in the world, the Woolworth Building, which was 75 stories in 1925, the largest building. I think that's what Winfield's Cafe is named after, his middle name. He had a huge estate out of Long Island. And now this, this, is, this is an ad that was in the, some of the Condé Nast uh, publications, courtesy of Greenwich Historical Society, just mentions some of the magazines that Condé Nast did print that were not Condé Nast publications. The New Yorker, Nation's Business, Scientific American, Brides Magazine, Texaco Star, Modern Photography, Farm Quarterly, and they printed 60 million copies annually, plus different catalogs of one sort or another for different mail order companies. And there were, according to this, about 900 persons in this division alone, and there were six different departments. Okay, we showed some of them earlier. Now this is a photo that I took uh, about six months into uh, working here, and I saw our previous uh, general manager, Thomas Delaney, out there one day with his camera, and he was out there taking some pictures, and you know, he was a little frustrated, and, and I said, Tom, what are you trying to do? He said, I'm trying to take a picture, I want to put it up on a leader. So I had already taken this picture, so I suggested, Tom, why don't we put this in there? So this has been there for about four and a half years, and it's still there when you come in and look at the readers. So I'm very proud of this. And you can see a small obelisk that the Hyatt has constructed, kind of in tribute to the Condé Nast obelisk. That's what that is. It's a miniature obelisk next to the sign when you come in. And the castle tower, which is still there, it remains. It's a logo for the Hyatt Regency Greenwich. It's on a lot of our stationery. And this is the old, an older picture looking at it. And that became, I think this is the same building as our bus stop. Is one of the engineers here? Is that the same building? Is that our bus stop there? Yeah, right the front of the bus stop. Yeah. Okay, but well, we must have moved it. No. It was original. It was still the same spot. Okay, it's in the same spot. Okay. okay. Maybe it's just a trick of my eye because it looks, it looks, oh yeah, that's right. Okay. And we carved our, uh, our <coughs> initials in the hotel. Okay, this is again a view of the fountain looking across East Putnam. It's still there. And I got a kick out of this. I blew this photo up, and I just want to point out, you can see across the street the gardens in this photo, which I'll now show you some pictures of. Okay, there were two gardens. There was the East Formal Garden and the West Formal Garden. Uh, this is a statue of the goddess Fortuna. And as you can see, this was where the employees could go during their lunch hour, or anybody who just wanted to walk around, have a beautiful place to walk. We, when we get a lot of visitors here, they sometimes say, is there some place I can walk? Is there some place I can go to just stretch my legs and look at something beautiful uh, besides these expensive houses? <laughs> and so we could have, if this garden was here, we could have said, oh, why don't you go and check out our nice formal gardens? But unfortunately, they were uh, neglected after a period of time, and they're not there anymore. Now, uh, this is a shot. Again, you can see our tower in the background. This was a part of that semicircle that was of equal size across the street from where the plant was. And again, since my clicker's not working too well here, there's these little sphinxes. If you're familiar with the, uh, they're, they're more of the variety of the Greek sphinx, Greek sphinx sphinxes. Interesting word. Um, and, uh, but they were there and they were very beautiful and it was an accentuated part of coming in as an entranceway. And the Egyptian temples had those entrances. 
And it looks like there's, there might be, if you look at the close-up, I'd be willing to bet there's a man's head here and a woman's head on the other side. I've seen various other uh, wealthy magnets, estates and properties, and they will usually do that, put the husband and wife and showcase them. So if someone, woman out there is looking for a Christmas present for their husband, you know, you might want to ask for, I want a sphinx deer with my face on it. You can have one of yours. That's okay. Now this is that same East, Eastern Formal Garden I was telling you about. It has the goddess Fortuna in the background. You can see how it's landscaped with the stairs and the terrace. And uh, there were many uh, people hired to work this property and keep it looking immaculate. And this is a close-up, unfortunately, in decay of the Sphinx. It's lost its wings. Uh, we see in the background, this was called the, um, uh, the Temple of the, lo the Love Garden. I'm sorry, the Love Temple, where people would get married and they would take their photographs under it. And now I'm just showing you a picture of the Great Sphinx of Giza, Egypt. You know, it's interesting how uh, Egypt played into a lot of the architecture. Remember, we have the obelisk, which is an Egyptian uh, structure, and now we have the Sphinx. And uh, the Masons follow very uh, closely a lot of the precepts that were developed in ancient Egypt. If you ever looked in a cemetery, you look at a, you look, you know, it's a normal American cemetery, but yet you see these obelisks in your area. And they're often very big, they're bigger than the crosses. Well, those are usually the graves of Masons. Quiet as is kept. You heard it first here. I'm not a Mason, so I can say that. But if I was a Mason, that would be a secret I'm not allowed to tell you. <laughs> and that's a close-up, unfortunately, again, of the decayed state of one of the, uh, that's the, uh, the love garden. doesn't look as lovely anymore, unfortunately. And the stat the statue, was a statue of Cupid inside it. The grown man Cupid. We're so used to seeing these little cherubs look like little babies with wings. But there was actually a god named Cupid uh, who was man-sized, who uh, was the consort of Venus, or Aphrodite, as she's also known. Now here's a photograph of the fountain that I took. Uh, one of these days, it was just a beautiful day out, and, and our folks from, I don't know if John Minnie, the landscapers, had done this, but if they did, it's a beautiful job. If they didn't, it's still a beautiful job <laughs> with the fountain running, and that's still out there today, right between uh, 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 1700 and 1800. Now this is a statue that remains on the other side. I shouldn't say remains. It was put in after Condé Nast left. Uh, I was so intrigued by this, I went to the Greenwich Historical Society and they showed me a label. It's called Seder, and Frederick Victor Ginsburg is the artist. And it's, it just was like, what is that doing there? It's so odd. You know? uh, it's a mythological character. And, uh, but the first thing I said is, this looks like Ian Anderson of the band Jethro Tull. You know that hard rock band? The guy that plays the flute with his... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. And there's a picture from behind, and of course you can see the castle tower underneath. I was like, that is, that is bizarre. Okay, this is, I promised, as I said, the High Regency Grange has made full use of the Condé Nast heritage. This is one of the uh, cards that we give out or to different guests for different events and different things that we had. I think this one was called Bed Ballroom and Beyond. <laughs> in November 2005. Okay. This is just to go over those, the features. Uh, there was a pattern building. Again, I said the Condé Nast came here in 1921 with the Arbor Press purchase. They had an electro-type foundry. That was a type of electronic uh, typing. 1931, the web press room was in 1937. Things started getting more sophisticated. And the Eastern Formal Garden had the, the Georgian Love Temple with the statue of Cupid in the middle. Uh, Georgian is uh, around the time of, you've heard of King George, okay? Um, matter of fact, the name Regency uh, comes from the Regency period, which was when Queen Victoria was on the throne of England. And uh, she would select these different rulers. This is when the British Empire was uh, said earlier all around the world. And it was a region. When there was a British ruler in that country, they were called regions. So that's where uh, the Prickster family decided that this regency branch of Hyatt Hotels would have a certain cachet. And we are the Hyatt Regency branch. And then the West Formal Guard, as I said earlier, had the statue of the Roman goddess Fortuna, who was basically there. This earlier was a Greek uh, god, goddess who basically held the scales, blindfolded. But over a period of time, these different gods and goddesses were changed and shifted, depending on what the society required. 
Okay, departments that went to the uh, Greenwich campus were the executive and administration, circulation and accounting, purchasing, makeup, research, pattern making, and editorial and advertising stayed in New York City. Okay, now I'm just going to go through some of the magazines without going into a lot of uh, detail, just kind of showing for you the, the different range of different magazine covers that Condé Nast has embarked on. Okay, this is from 1934. And they started doing uh, some various, mix, a mix and match between photography and having graphic illustrators and different prestigious painters to do the covers. This is 1942. And it includes the Vogue pattern book. Here's Glamour. That's Betty Davis on the cover, the actress. This is a uh, not too well-known actress, Deanna Durbin, but she's on the cover of Glamour, looking very glamorous. This is Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara in the famous movie Gone with the Wind on their cover. It was 15 cents, by the way, that issue. And this is Glamour again. I like now that these titles start to come up. Up in the upper right-hand corner it says, For the girl with a job. 48 ways to wear color. And this, I thought, was a really nice photo showing the prestige that women, no man in this photo. Girls night out, having their own fun, going to their own places, doing their own thing, and very fashionably doing it. Here's a photograph of Marlene Dietrich, the German actress uh, who was very popular here in America. That's again by Horst P. Hurst sitting in her limousine. Again, this was, again, allowing someone to be that fly on the wall into the glamorous life. You know, for 15 cents or 20 cents, you could, wow, look at all this stuff. Wow, this is amazing. You know? So these were different times. This is all before uh, the proliferation of uh, the common radio in every home and TVs like today. And this is rather mysterious. This is by Edward Steichen, one of the more mysterious. You can see now how they're working with lighting, trying to come up with an amazing effects. And I also thought it was great because she has on a corset, and this was like a statement of women are free now. No more corsets. And then this was in uh, June 1932, Vogue cover. This was famous because this was the first full color magazine cover in the United States, maybe even in the world. But this is where the Condé Nast technicians really, really started to hone in on those processes and making it sort of bigger than life. You know, a lot of photography is just a document life, but he wanted his photos to be bigger than life. And here's an interesting photo, I believe it's by the same Edward Steichen, where you have a very brave ladies <laughs> between two elephants and displaying someone's uh, fashion there. And this, this lady, I don't know the name of, uh, there's Twiggy. We had in the 60s, uh, very thin ladies were starting to be featured. And Twiggy was probably the most famous, and she graced a lot of covers in the Kanye West magazine. She, she was British, and again, it was the English accent with the Beatles and the British invasion of music was very fashionable. So she was extremely popular. She was sort of the Kate Moss of her day. And then this was Calvin Klein, who was, again, doing very provocative covers, didn't want to follow the herd. And uh, I'm sure some people got shocked, and that happens to be Kate Moss there, who uh, recently is now doing her own clothing line, from, her, from what I understand. So if you like Kate Moss, you can buy her clothes now. And then these are the supermodels on the left. Uh, let's see. We have uh, Stephanie Seymour on the left there. I actually drove her when I drove limousines for uh, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. You know, the doorman came out and says, uh, Miss Seymour's coming out now. And I had my back turned. And she sat in the back, the door closed, and I turned around. And I wanted to say, where would you like to go, ma'am? But I... First words just came in my mouth. Oh, oh, that Miss Seymour. <laughs> she lives here in town. Oh, she does. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, and with that, is there anyone here that uh, was associated or used to live in Greenwich or maybe like to share something about? Uh, I know I had, there were some people out there earlier. I was hoping to come back. Maybe they will. Okay, so this was a uh, an interesting age, and the supermodels were starting to uh, get pretty famous. And I thought this was kind of cute. This is kind of like the Beatles. You know, this was in the Italian Vogue in 1989, where the, where the uh, ladies are saying, uh, yeah, we're a band. What about it? And then this was sort of that, that evolution of Vogue into, uh, you know, what they call crazy. They would call these crazy covers. 
You know, but they just have shoes and bags and, and uh, dresses. And this happens to be the designer, Edmundo Castillo here, uh, surrounded 